welcome everybody, all the attendees. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. And as you probably know, it is part of an ongoing series that was developed as part of an FDA funded project called a targeted learning framework for causal effect estimation using real world data. And today we're fortunate to have Dr. John Kinkato and Dr. Hannah Lee from the FDA as co-presenters. The title of their talk is TMLE, a BAA project to advance regulatory science and leverage real world evidence in regulatory decision making. So I'm going to um, briefly, you know, just just go over their bios and then by that, that then and after that I will turn it over to John as our first presenter. So John Kinkato, MD, MS, MPH is Associate Director of the Office of Medical Policy for Real World Evidence Analytics in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the FDA. In seeking to enhance policies related to drug development and regulatory review, his responsibilities include coordinating CEDAR's Real World Evidence Program, serving as Chair of the Real World Evidence Subcommittee, developing internal agency processes, processes supporting guidance development and demonstration projects, and interacting with external stakeholders. He also supports activities in the Office of Medical Policy Initiatives. Dr. Hannah Lee is a senior statistical reviewer of the Office of Biostatistics in the CEDAR FDA. She leads and oversees various FDA funded projects intended to support development of the agency's real world evidence program, including multiple sentinel projects to develop causal inference frameworks for conducting non-randomized studies to enhance analytic capacity using machine learning based methods and to implement sensitivity analysis for real world evidence studies at the study design stage as well as this BAA TMLE project. She's currently a co-lead of real world evidence scientific working group of the American Statistical Association biopharmaceutical section. So Dr. Kinkato and Dr. Lee, thank you very much for joining us today. And whenever you're ready, John, you can take over and please start your presentation. You. Okay, great. And regrets to the audience for the uh, technical difficulties, but in the interest of time, uh, I'll go by without presentation mode and I'll jump right in. Uh, my goal is to provide a, a very high level overview of FDA's real world evidence program. Uh, the views and opinions obviously are mine and are not FDA policy, and I don't have any conflicts of interest. Uh, let's start with the 21st Century Cures Act of 2016, with virtually all of us know, uh, FDA was asked to establish a program to evaluate the potential use of real world evidence to either support a new indication for a drug already approved or to satisfy post approval study requirements. We were asked to have a framework by December 2018 and guidance for industry by December of 2021. Importantly, our standard for substantial evidence remains unchanged and our commitments in real world evidence aligned with uh, PDUFA. Uh, this is the 2018 framework that we did uh, generate uh, on time. It applies to CDER and CBER. The Center for Devices has their own guidance uh, and framework. And uh, I will return to this later, but basically as a summary, the program involves internal processes, external stakeholder engagement, guidance development and demonstration projects. Uh, last but not least, the demonstration projects, which is what we're here to talk about today, one project in particular that Dr. Lee will be describing. Uh, just very briefly to, uh, out of necessity, just to mention again, remind us that real world data for data relating to patient health status for delivery of healthcare routinely collected from a variety of sources. We often think of EHRs and medical claims or registries, but don't forget patient generated data uh, from in-home settings and wearable devices. And then the definition of real world evidence flows directly from real world data in that it's uh, evidence regarding the usage and potential benefits and risks of a medical product if it's derived from real world data. Importantly, the bottom of that slide on the lower right, you see that while we often think of observational studies in that regard, RWE is not synonymous with observational studies, rather externally controlled trials working backwards or even large randomized trials, large simple trials, pragmatic trials uh, fit the bill in that they do involve real world data. Uh, this slide is mainly here to point out again that pre 21st century cures for years, actually for decades, we have been using quote unquote real world evidence for safety, right? FDA Sentinel initiative is highlighted in this slide on the left, you see the uh, uh, monitor showing using real world data to, uh, to study medical product safety. And the table on the right just shows a couple of recent examples, but this goes back many years. But the, the fuss or the interest 
is study design uh, is about real world evidence for efficacy. So this slide on study design in the era of real world evidence is titled randomized observational uh, interventional and real world, what's in the name? I wish I had more time really to talk about uh, RCTs and observational studies, but one of the take home points uh, that you see, hopefully the font is large enough, uh, a randomized trial versus observational dichotomy, it's overly simplistic. We sometimes use it as shorthand and I'm guilty of that as well. But when we're talking about uh, causal inference, we have to be uh, very specific in terms of what design we're using and what methodology we're bringing to bear. So this article uh, emphasized the need for clarity regarding interventional or non-interventional designs, primary collection of data or secondary use of already collected data, uh, characteristics of comparison groups, and also uh, disease heterogeneity, sort of prognostic uh, determinism or causal de determinism as it might be uh, described. Uh, so here, if I were to offer one slide as the FDA view of the landscape, this would be it. Uh, we see uh, for the first row, we go from randomized interventional studies to non-randomized interventional studies to non-randomized and non-interventional studies. And from left to right, we have an increasing reliance on real world data. So on the left, in the middle of this slide, a traditional randomized trial even could use elements of real world data. We might not think of it this as real world evidence, but even if you use real world data to assess enrollment criteria, trial feasibility, or to uh, identify outcomes using EHR claims, it's, it's a continuum, it's not an either or, which is the point of the prior slide. In the middle, uh, column trials and clinical practice settings, uh, trials with pragmatic, pragmatic elements, AKA pragmatic trials, uh, are where there's more reliance on real world data. And more towards the right, the third of four or the fourth or fifth columns, depending on how you look at this, um, this slide is a single arm study that would be interventional, but the external control arm, if it comes from a real world data set, uh, that would be uh, non-randomized but still the overall study would be uh, viewed by FDA as interventional because of the single arm that was uh, of, of that design type. And then while we haven't seen a lot of such studies to date for regulatory purposes, the conventional or traditional observational cohort study and case control study is, is uh, obviously non-randomized, uh, non-interventional. So this uh, is, is just an overview to uh, get our bearings straight. Um, more of an applied approach is shown here. When FDA receives submissions that include real world evidence, our key considerations as described in our framework are whether the real world data are fit for use, whether the trial or study design as per the prior slide can generate real world, excuse me, can generate adequate scientific evidence to answer the regulatory question. And then of course the study conduct at the same time has to meet FDA regulatory uh, requirements. So here's where I'll, I'll uh, move to what I, I mentioned earlier, that I do want to uh, lead up to the demonstration project, which is the main reason we're here today. But if I could just take a minute or two to talk about internal uh, agency processes and external stakeholder engagement, I do so on this one slide that I'll develop um, in, 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 uh, in a few minutes here. Real World Evidence Subcommittee is a central feature of real world evidence activities. It's comprised of FDA staff, from multiple uh, CDER and CBER offices. And this subcommittee provides oversight of policy development uh, on real world evidence guidances that I'll uh, mention in, uh, in a few slides. It offers resources and leadership to the review divisions uh, until sufficient experience is gained across the board uh, in FDA and, and other activities. In terms of external engagement, uh, the same subcommittee provides feedback on early stage proposals from sponsors, vendors, and other entities. And we also discuss initiatives that are presented to the subcommittee uh, for their consideration. And then there are sort of miscellaneous other activities uh, beyond the subcommittee, albeit with the subcommittee awareness, such as when we hold FDA or central level public workshops on our WE related topics, or we conduct webinars or other speaking engagements. Uh, and, today might be considered an external engagement. Um, in terms of guidance development, I'm not gonna say much I can, other than perhaps stay tuned. Uh, but what I've done here on this slide is to take a snapshot of what we said in our 2018 framework. So these are topics, not guidance titles, uh, but, and we will not have a single overall real world evidence guidance. Rather, 
uh, we will have guidance that addresses these domains of using trials or studies with real world data, real world evidence for effectiveness, which is again, where keen interest resides. Uh, but there also is a focus on the upstream aspect of assessing the fitness of use of the real world data in the first place, whether it comes from EHR claims or registries or elsewhere. Um, we will have uh, guidance uh, on study designs proper. And we also, of course, see the need to have uh, recommendations regarding regulatory considerations. If 21 CFR 312 doesn't apply, uh, what will sponsors do? And then uh, perhaps the most upstream in a way, conceptually, or data standards, uh, since these data, when they're real world data, do not come from clinical trials, uh, what are the data standards um, for a set submission? Uh, what we've done so far is really uh, uh, generate what we call a tracking guidance, which is how to submit documents using real world data and real world evidence to FDA, in part because the terminology issue that I mentioned earlier, it's really hard to identify. Uh, real world data, real world evidence when the field, I'm not, not blaming sponsors here, but there's a little bit of socializing that needs to be done or uh, to reach a steady state where we all call the same design by using the same terminology. But then mainly, and here's the please uh, stand by aspect, uh, guidance is in the pipeline and we hope to see it soon, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about it today. And then uh, here's where we catch up with demonstration projects. What I wanted to do in, in just uh, a few minutes was to give a broad based view of the scope of demonstration projects and then pass the baton to, uh, to Hannah to go into detail about what we're all here to uh, discuss today. Uh, this slide shows um, demonstration projects grouped informally into three buckets. Uh, using real world data or about the data itself, the middle bucket or the middle category study design. And then we have a third category for tools. When I generated the slide set, I had animation for the arrows. So please don't be too distracted by them. What I was trying to do here is uh, if we had more time, I could go into more detail. Uh, but the eye care project on the left, I have a slide to follow that just scratches beneath the surface. So I don't just wave this slide at you and move on. Uh, I'll mention the Genentech uh, hybrid RCT design project and then the TMLE uh, acronym. I'm asking for uh, uh, you know, a free pass, a license to use the acronym because Hannah's gonna describe it in more detail. But let's take these demonstration projects again, one at a time to provide a little color, so to speak. Uh, the eye care project is an example of a demonstration project to improve real world data in and of itself. In other words, right now we say, well, the data at the bedside, we don't blame clinicians for what they do, but we wish it were better. Well, uh, this slide, and uh, I'll just summarize briefly by saying uh, in the oncology field, the RESIST criteria, this initiative is trying to have clinicians enter information such that we get quote unquote research grade information on cancer disease status and treatment change, why uh, a change in treatment was made. So when medical records are um, reviewed, we have information that's approaching the quality of a clinical trial. I could say more, but again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna hit page down. Again, the animation didn't work for some reason, uh, but, with this, but this slide shows our four out of 31 applications to a UO1 a competitive award. Uh, these four grants uh, were awarded based on a, a peer review process internal to FDA. And uh, all four are, are very important and are very uh, you know, near and dear to our heart, as they say, but the second row, I'm not endorsing Genentech, it just happens to be a design um, uh, proposal where the second row applying novel statistical approaches to develop a decision framework for hybrid RCT designs, combining internal control arms with data from real world data sources. So I offer this as an example of how FDA is supporting uh, demonstration projects that are trying to nurture uh, the field and grow the field forward. And then uh, actually I'll say last but not least again, regard with regard to um, TMLE, we'll hear more about that uh, soon. And again, these categories are informal because you, you always have data and design. So actually Dr. Lee might say, well, we could be in a different bucket and I would agree, but uh, that's uh, for another time, another uh, place to discuss. What I wanna end up with though, wrap up with is, let's be clear, even before the 21st Century Cures Act, uh, real world evidence was being used by FDA uh, when fit for purpose to make effectiveness decisions. You see here, 
Uh, I won't read any of them, uh, but from 2010 through 2015, pre-21st century cures, well, I, I'll, I'll take that back. Linitumumab for the treatment of acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the third row just comes to mind. This is a traditional, if you will, or just a, uh, a typical external control trial where a single arm trial was done. And then what we now call real world data from 694 patients at European and US study sites were brought to bear against the single arm trial. And given the large effect size and other considerations, this was judged to be um, uh, suitable for, uh, for an effectiveness decision indication. So I just wanna point out that this is pre 21st century cures. Uh, in the cures era, uh, we have four uh, examples here. I'll again just refer very briefly to the third row to give CBER a shout out to say that Zostavax, the Zoxter vaccine live, uh, used observational cohort data actually to characterize the duration of protection in persons 50 years of age and older. So again, there's a, a continuum of what the evidence is used for regarding a regulatory purpose, but nonetheless, uh, hopefully you see the point of my showing these slides and my highlighting one on, on each of these two slides. And then last but not least, and very recently, uh, if you hadn't heard, a new indication for PROGRAF uh, to Prolimus based on real world evidence. The drug had been approved to prophylax against organ rejection in patients receiving liver transplants way back to 94, and later for kidney and heart based on randomized controlled trials. And the drug for various reasons is widely used in clinical care, but clinical trials were never done for lung transplant or at least for regulatory purposes. Uh, but a supplemental NDA was, uh, was received with a non-interventional real-world evidence study. The data and design were evaluated uh, according to FDA standards, and the approval for prevent, uh, preventing rejection uh, and death in lung transplant patients was granted uh, not even a month ago. Uh, digging a little bit more deeply to show that we practice what we preach, the data were from the U.S. Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients. It was considered fit for use data. It's on all lung transplants in the US for a defined period, actually up to the present. It, it's almost research grade uh, data again. The design was a non-interventional uh, treatment arm uh, with uh, comparison to historical controls, whereby without immunosuppression, uh, we know that uh, it's essentially 0% survival at one year. So FDA determined that this study was adequate and well controlled and the uh, outcome of organ rejection and death are virtually certain without therapy, as, as I just mentioned. So this dramatic effect of treatment helps to preclude bias as an explanation of results. And that's very important. This, this approval is noteworthy in FDA approving a drug and, and viewing a, a non-interventional study as adequate and well-controlled, but it doesn't mean that uh, uh, every similar study is going to reach the same evidentiary threshold. Uh, it certainly helped an awful lot that the effect size, as one would call it, was so dramatic that sources of bias or even chance are pretty much excluded from possibility. But nonetheless, uh, we, we uh, looked at this study very carefully and we used our existing standards and the decision was made. Uh, so with that, my final segue is just to continue that same point. Our regulatory standard for adequate evidence is, is at uh, 21 CFR 314.126. And as mentioned, the goal is to distinguish the effect of the drug from other influences, such as spontaneous change in disease course, placebo effect, or bias observation. Our highest uh, bar of evidence is adequate and well-controlled studies as the primary basis for determining whether substantial evidence exists. And then while trend, uh, traditional randomized trials include probabilistic control of confounding through randomization, uh, blinding, and standardized outcome assessments, et cetera, uh, we are evaluating observational methods defined generally, defined broadly in this context. So that's where uh, the remainder of this afternoon's session fits in. Uh, again, as one seed of many seeds that we planted uh, to try to help grow the field, so to speak, uh, I look forward to uh, Dr. Lee's presentation for the remainder of this uh, period, as well as the question and answer. So uh, a little bit brisk in pace, but I hope this was effective. I intentionally did not include a summary slide to save time, but I will say if there are any questions about this presentation, uh, please either email me or more appropriately email the Cedar Medical Policy Real World Evidence uh, address shown here, and we'll be happy to respond. Uh, so Susan, thank you for inviting me and Hannah, thank you uh, for giving me this time. And again, look forward to the remainder of the, of the session. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, John. Um, if we have time at the end, then I will invite attendee questions. But for now, I would like to just um, directly go to Hannah's portion of the presentation. So Hannah, you can start sharing when you're ready. Thanks, John and Susan. Um, and John, uh, by the way, that was a very compact, but very, very efficient presentation, I think. Um, so now uh, I'll now discuss some specifics of this BAA project titled A Targeted Learning Framework for Causal Effect Estimation Using Real World Data. I put a disclaimer because this presentation will be posted online. Um, this presentation reflects my view only and should not be construed to represent the agency's views or policies. I'm going to briefly talk about motivation and overarching aim of the project, then discuss the potential uh, regulatory use of targeted maximum likelihood estimation short for TMLE. Uh, I'll then review specific aims of this project and share findings and takeaway messages. And as a wrap up, I'll review deliverables and some useful resources in TMLE that'll be particularly helpful for our everyday review work. So motivation and overarching aim. Um, I copied this slide from uh, John's presentation. As John described in the, his presentation, FDA has been committed to enhance our ability to consider the potential use of reward data in evaluating drug safety and efficacy since the 21st Century Cures Act and the authorization of the PDUFA-6. Um, by 2021, FDA promised to publish the a draft guidance on how real-world evidence can contribute to the assessment of safety and effectiveness of medical products in regulatory submissions. And this BAA project is a part of these efforts. Uh, what we learned from this project is supposed to inform the guidance development, particularly in sections related to methods and statistical analysis. The primary goal of this project is to help FDA develop a principled approach to incorporating real world data into regulatory decision making. It plans to apply what's so called a targeted learning perspective to define the causal problem and target estimate, and also to identify potential threats to interpretability as a causal estimate derived from real world data. And it also plans to compare the performance of TMLE with other two popular propensity score based methods, propensity score matching and propensity score weighting, AKA inverse probability weighting, but I'm just gonna call it propensity score weighting. And these two methods are somewhat you know, widely used for regulatory science so far. I'll now discuss the TMLE's potential for regulatory purposes. And there's a reason uh, why we choose this project among all the other candidate projects. First of all, TMLE follows a rigorous systematic roadmap called Targeted Learning Framework, which aligns very well with ICH E9R1 estimate framework as a way to define and estimate the target quantity, such as like, you know, um, hazard ratio, odds ratio, risk difference, risk ratio, you know, certain type of um, target quantity you're interested in. This means that it provides a nice way to evaluate which clinical questions can or cannot be answered based on information in selected real world data. And it also means that every step of the implementation of TMLE can be pre-specified in a protocol or SAP in a very transparent way. Secondly, there's been a growing interest in the use of machine learning for regulatory purposes, right? TMLE is one of those methods that can utilize machine learning. In fact, it can utilize an ensemble of various machine learning algorithms called super learning um, for modeling um, and estimating propensity score and or modeling outcome. So in general, uh, TMLE has been shown to reduce bias and improve precision compared to propensity score methods. Also, what I personally like about TMLE is the fact that it is based on well-established statistical theory. 
This makes TMLE somewhat unique compared to the other types of machine learning based methods for causal effect estimation. Um, this means that statisticians can have much, for it, much better understanding about under what conditions TMLE could succeed or fail. Um, just to give you a little bit of example, um, Bayesian additive regression tree or BART, uh, which is one of um, machine learning approaches has been shown to perform very well for causal effect estimation. However, the problem is in the inference or uncertainty estimation part. Um, I noticed a couple literature reported potential coverage issue with BART due to the underestimation of standard error. And um, to my knowledge, uh, no one really knows why that happens. And that's exactly the problem with machine learning based methods in general. They can perform pretty well for prediction or effect estimation, but when it comes to uncertainty or variance estimation, that's usually based on bootstrap type of methods and often lack of rigorous theory. On the contrary, um, because TMLE has built upon solid statistical theory, valid uncertainty estimation is possible when sample size is large, which will lead to more reliable um, inference. Even sample size is not too large, um, this method has been shown to have good finite sample performance. In the past decades, um, its statistical property and uh, performances have been widely studied and validated um, outside the regulatory setting, such as in academia. So that is um, sort of another assurance to bring this new innovation into regulatory setting. It also has um, so-called doubly robust property um, over here, uh, which means that um, it could provide an unbiased treatment effect estimate when either propensity score or outcome regression uh, model is correct. Um, last, uh, last but not least, it is easy to implement um, as its software and packages are uh, well developed and maintained over time. Uh, this is a brief overview of uh, targeted learning roadmap. It starts from a causal clinical question we want to address. Um, for example, uh, the question could have been, uh, does drug A improve outcome B compared to a standard care drug C among indicated patient D, you know, something like that. Then the targeted learning roadmap uses a causal framework or a causal model um, to identify and define the target estimate corresponding to the clinical question of interest. Once defining your target quantity uh, from steps number two to three, we set up and conduct a statistical analysis aligned to the target estimate. And these processes include sensitivity analysis to the assumptions we use to define the target estimate in corresponding analysis. So what's important during all these processes is that the roadmap requires us to specifically state underlying assumptions to define the target estimate and corresponding analysis plan. So this means that you really have to understand exactly what assumptions your estimate and your analysis are based upon. And you should provide a plan or conduct sensitivity analysis to explore the robustness of the study findings. So this is not surprising for us as a regulator, right? Because this is a part of our major review focuses. However, you should note that not all scientific domains and practices have the same norm or it takes the same perspective as the regulatory perspective. And that's why TMLE that follows this type of a roadmap fits really well for regulatory purposes. I'll now discuss specific tests, findings, and key takeaway messages. This project has four aims. One, analysis of high quality randomized clinical trial data 
and simulated data with synthetic selection bias and informative missingness in outcome. Number two, conducting analysis of RCT data with substantial loss to follow up. Three, highlighting the importance of following targeted learning roadmap to assess the validity and interpretability of study findings using an observational study. And number four, education and dissemination of concepts in targeted learning, causal inference, and machine learning. This webinar series is a part of test four. Test one started from identifying a high quality RCT data that I'm going to describe in a minute. Then test 1.1 aimed to conduct analysis of the high quality RCT data to estimate average treatment effect using various methods, including TMLE, to address the following two questions. First, can we reproduce published findings for high quality RCTs using causal methodologies, such as propensity score methods or TMLE? Second, can we potentially use those causal methodologies for analysis of RCT data? Um, then the rest of the subtests are to evaluate whether we can potentially use propensity score methods or TMLE to address some methodological issues in traditional clinical trials, such as selection bias or um, informative missingness in outcome, and also to evaluate performance of TMLE as compared to those of uh, propensity score methods. This project used international stroke trial as a running example, uh, which had large number of observations with near perfect randomization and retention. The goal of this study was to estimate additive effect of aspirin compared to no aspirin on stroke patients with two primary outcomes, 14 day mortality and recurrent stroke event. The target estimate was average treatment effect and this BAA team compared four different analyses. First approach was unadjusted analysis, um, meaning that the final analysis model includes treatment as a sole covariate. This is the conventional method for a successful RCT data. Then the team compared for performance of propensity score matching with and without adjusting for covariates in the final analysis model, propensity score weighting, and TMLE. Uh, key takeaway messages from test one are basically yes to all of these questions we raised. Yes, we can reproduce published findings for high quality RCTs using causal methodologies such as propensity score methods or TMLE. And thus, yes, we can potentially use those methods for analysis of RCT data. Um, from test 1.2 to 1.4, we confirm that we can also potentially use those methods to address some methodological issues in traditional clinical trials. And finally, we confirm that TMLE performs better than propensity score methods for most cases. For test two, the team identified RCT data with substantial loss to follow up. The example study um, aimed to examine the effect of acupuncture uh, compared to usual care using pragmatic RCT design on 400 patients. Data were collected at three, five, nine, and 12 month of follow up, and about 25% subjects had missing outcome by the end of the study follow up. The study authors conducted both complete case analysis and sensitivity analysis using an imputation method. Um, so the BAA team compared the author's analyses with propensity score matching, weighting, and TMLE while trying to account for the loss to follow up using intermediate data. And here's a summary of analyses results. First, 
For matching, we observed that post-match adjustment in the final outcome analysis model was clearly helpful. And this type of approach is generally recommended by experts as well. However, results sometimes vary substantially depending on the order of matching. For propensity score weighting, we observed that using super learning, which is an ensemble of various machine learning algorithms, uh, for propensity score estimation improved the performance of the approach a little bit. And overall, the performance was pretty stable over different analytic specifications. TMLE with super learning also demonstrated quite stable performance, uh, providing the most efficient results with smallest standard errors and narrowest confidence intervals. So task two, uh, results demonstrated that the TMLE with super learning could be a powerful yet flexible enough tool for handling complex longitudinal data structure, uh, such as presence of treatment non-compliance or loss to follow-up. Test two also confirmed that TMLE could produce reliable, stable, and efficient results. Uh, more importantly, this test illustrated how pre-specified machine learning algorithms define the analysis before any data are collected, while preserving the, abil uh, the ability to fit flexible models in a data-adaptive fashion. This means that uh, we can still utilize machine learning and data-adaptive processes uh, while still complying with the regulatory requirements, such as uh, pre-specification of design and analysis plan in an outcome-blinded fashion. Task three aimed to highlight the importance of following the targeted learning roadmap to assess the validity and interpretability of study findings. This team identified a retrospective observational cohort study on retadrine hydro, uh, hydrochloride and pulmonary edema in twin pregnancy among uh, about 200 Japanese women as a running example. The goal of this observational study was to estimate the effect of a one unit increase in retadrine dose on the risk of getting pulmonary edema and the author stated that the conditional effect of redigree, um, measured in OS ratio scale and interpreted as an association measure, is the target quantity. Um, study authors conducted adjusted analysis as the main mode of analysis. Uh, however, this was uh, highly problematic as the authors adjusted for not only baseline covariates, but also post-treatment variables and post-outcome variables. Um, this BAA team compared the author's analysis with uh, propensity score matching weighting and TMLE. But again, uh, comparing analysis results are not the main goal of this test. A more important goal is to follow the targeted learning roadmap and assess the validity and interpretability of study findings. So that's going to be the focus of the key takeaway messages for uh, this test three. And viewing the author's analysis uh, from the targeted learning roadmap perspective raises uh, several red flags. For example, the author's analysis um, model uh, was based on a monotonic dose response relationship, and this was not supported by the data. And as I mentioned before, the author's model was based on a flawed uh, covariate adjustment as a control for post-treatment and post-outcome covariates. And we could have avoided these mistakes very easily by following the targeted learning roadmap, which does not restrict our model to be a specific parametric regression model, but rather the targeted learning roadmap says um, or defines uh, the statistical model as all possible probability distributions of data consistent with true knowledge. So when it comes to an estimation using TMLE, uh, we could consider a rich library for super learning uh, to allow for modeling a much more flexible relationship between outcome treatment dose and uh, covariates. 
So uh, in conclusion, by following the targeted learning roadmap, which involves the assessment of underlying assumptions, we could conclude that the author's target estimate is not identifiable from the data. In other words, the author's study question is not addressable from the data without making strong modeling assumptions that are not supported by the data. Therefore, we conclude that the validity and interpretability of study findings are questionable. Um, in addition, what the targeted learning roadmap uh, could do to us is sort of uh, help us think through about what types of questions can be addressed by the available data. For example, I just said the author study question, uh, let me go back to this, uh, author's questions, uh, question, which is the effect of a one unit increase in reader dream dose on the risk of pulmonary edema is not addressable by the data. Then what could have been addressable? Uh, there are a couple options where one option could have been changing the causal question by redefining the treatment. We could have considered a point treatment effect instead of dose. Or we could have considered a realistic treatment role that conforms to how treatment is administered in the real world setting. And they use that information um, to estimate the effect of a specific treatment role. For example, the label for reader dream says that reader dream is contraindicated in women with certain pre existing conditions. So if these women never receive reader dream, then we can learn from data on how the population level risk changes under the following treatment role. Always treat them uh, with reader dream unless it is expressly contraindicated um, you know, by using uh, the you know, well, uh, women who never treated reader dream due to their pre-existing conditions um, as a comparator group. I'll now review project deliverables and some useful resources for our review work. Test one, two, and three have been all completed. Um, FDA has received and reviewed study reports and manuscripts are in preparation. Uh, just to remind you, test four uh, is about education and dissemination of concepts in uh, targeted learning, causal inference and machine learning, including this seminar series. And recordings from previous webinars are available in FDA CEDAR RWE SharePoint website, and they are also posted on YouTube. Um, some instructional videos on TMLE and super learning are not yet publicly available, but soon to be posted on YouTube. Um, uh, just in case, if you're interested in, uh, I put the link uh, at the end of this presentation. Uh, the, the link for instructional videos are available to FDA staff, but just note that uh, the PI, uh, PI of this project, Susan, um, has been working on some final touch on the videos. Um, I think what might be really helpful for our review work uh, would be this one, the third one, targeted learning based SAP. This will be an example version of SAP illustrating how to write or review an SAP that follows the targeted learning roadmap to define target estimate, design the study, and set up an, uh, set up an analysis plan that uses um, TMLE. As I mentioned before, the targeted learning framework is very much aligned with ICH E9R1 estimate framework. So this example SAP illustrates how to achieve goals and standards in the ICH E9R1 framework respecting intercurrent events typically necessitates a longitudinal viewpoint. What I really like about this SAP is that it provides a comprehensive checklist for reviewers slash uh, sponsors to completely pre-specify the analysis. For example, this checklist includes specification of random seed, our software and package versions, list of machine learners in the super learner library, and et cetera. So 
um, having this checklist in hand can definitely aid transparency and reproducibility of sponsors analysis, particularly when they plan to use machine learning based methods and or data adaptive process for analysis. A draft uh, version of this SAP will be available for uh, those who attend the TMLE short course at this year's uh, regulatory industry statistics workshop. And here's the list of webinars and trainings uh, provided by um, as a part of test core. Again, there's a link for each of these webinars. So check them out if you're interested. Uh, most of them cover statistical aspects of TMOE, but some of them, uh, for example, on number 10, the targeted machine learning and actions in the ICU actually talks about how the use of machine learning and AI has the potential to transform a real healthcare model into a preventive healthcare service. And the speaker is not a statistician. Um, Dr. Pirazia is the chief of anesthesia and pre-operative medicine at San, Fr uh, San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center. Um, and for example, this talk by Dr. Laura Balzer illustrates how TMLE can actually be used in real randomized trials. Uh, upcoming resources, findings from BAA test one, two, three will be coming soon uh, and the SAP will be coming soon as well. Uh, we're also working on the TMLE and super learner guidance paper which aims to provide some practical considerations for using TMLE and super learning. This paper will provide recommendations on data dependence specifications using a detailed flow chart. Uh, and this flow chart uh, shows step-by-step -step guide guidelines for specifying a super learner in practice. And also in this paper, uh, we provide several running examples and archives they can show how uh, TMLE with super learning can be applied to a variety of uh, real world settings, such as small samples, rare outcomes, clusters, and high dimensional settings. Another paper we are working on is about weight truncation for uh, propensity score weighting and TMLE. One of the usual questions about propensity score weighting is how big of the value of inverse probability treatment we, we should consider uh, for truncation or trimming, right? Should it be five or should it be 10, 15 or 100? Or can we simply just consider upper 95th percentile or 99th percentile for truncation? And usually our answer is sort of an ad hoc value uh, for bounding the weight, right? So this paper, aims to demonstrate a general but systematic uh, weight bounding strategy with respect to minimizing mean square error. Uh, and last but not least, we're also planning for a hands-on training, hoping that this could happen as an in-person training, but um, given the Delta variant surge, uh, we are still waiting to see whether this could be an in-person training or virtual. And uh, as a one last note, uh, please feel free to reach out to us if you're interested in using TMLE and if you need support for your own project. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, this excellent BAA team members. PI is Susan Gruber, the host of this webinar. Uh, Mark Vanderland uh, is the expert consultant from UC Berkeley. Rachel is our research assistant. And Martin Ho, former a uh, former FDA colleague who is now the head of um, biostatistics at Google Health, is also in this team. Uh, from Cedar OMP side, John, Ken, Deanne, and Nalin have been all working together on this project. And here are some web links for your information. And I, you know, talked about during the presentation. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, um, sorry, I didn't um, you know, put my email on it, but uh, my email is hannah.lee at fda.hhs.gov. Um,
hhs.gov uh, with my name. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Kama. That was a very uh, comprehensive overview and I really appreciate it. The summary was great. Oh, we have a whole bunch of input on the chat. So I will read the one from Stephanie Omicaro. Great presentation, thank you. What systems do we utilize to review or independently confirm EHR data? Essentially, do we have access to receive national or global EHR databases? So Hannah or John, do you have a response for that? John, you're muted. Uh, thanks, ah. Stephanie. Uh, I would say we're in the process of developing uh, systems to both receive that in the first place, as well as to uh, be more systematic in our approach to receive databases of different types. And then at the end of the day, um, you know, it's ultimately right, Stephanie becomes a case by case decision in terms of whether the data are fit for use, but it's a multifaceted uh, situation. And uh, even something as specific as third party data vendors, for example, there's ongoing conversations regarding how exactly uh, those uh, relationships between the sponsor, the vendor, and FDA work out. So certainly not uh, a question that could be answered in the space of a couple minutes, but uh, a topic that's under active, um, you know, active investigation slash uh, ongoing efforts. Uh, this is Anna. I can add a little bit to it. Um, so sometimes we have a third party uh, to gain the access to those EHR data. I forgot the name, um, but there's a you know independent um, resource or I should call a company or something that has a you know direct access to a couple of claims data, and then we can gain to some of those claims commercial claims data only through that platform. I'm sorry, I don't recall the name, but there are some platforms like that. And for some of the databases, we can request uh, the access directly through sponsors. I think that's what happened um, for the, uh, you know, long transplantation uh, case. Um, so that's to gain the access to the national registry data. But for some of the global uh, EHR databases, we might have limited access because for example, you know, the database from like Europe, they may not want to share their own, you know, database with us. So sometimes we do confront some, you know, um, you know, what well, challenges in gaining the direct access to data. Thank you. And Stephanie wrote, thank you. Helpful insights. There's one more question in the Q&A that will fit in, try to fit in, and then that we'll have to end it there. Um, the question is real world data and real world evidence are important from COVID-19 point of view, but the data come from largely observational studies. Can TMLE be used for such scenarios? So Hannah, I guess we'll leave that from to you. Yeah, of course, but I can say that it can be applied to 100% case. You know, we always have to review uh, case by case, but, um, you know, uh, and it always comes down to a specific review issues. Um, but, you know, and then uh, John talked about three major considerations for reviewing real world data and real world evidence. First is data fit for purpose. So, uh, first of all, the data should be, you know, well, good quality enough to, uh, you know, answer your clinical question. So that would be our, uh, the first uh, review uh, issue. And the second one is the design, appropriate design. We should always, you know, ensure uh, by following the targeted learning roadmap or using TMLE, we should ensure that the design is adequate. And also we should, you know, make sure that the study conduct is appropriate as well. So as long as those three major considerations are, um, you know, uh, properly reviewed and then we can ensure that um, the observational study sort of, um, you know, satisfies the substantial evidence, um, you know, criteria, which requires adequate and, um, you know, well-designed study, then I don't think, um, you know, why, um, 
I, I think TMLE can be definitely a helpful tool to uh, evaluate the evidence generated from observational studies. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, our time is up. So once again, Hannah and John, thank you so much for your presentation today.